Another year, another Jackbox. If you're new to the channel or Jackbox as a whole, the Jackbox Party Packs are a series of party games, one of my absolute favorites in fact, where only one person has to buy the game, and then you and all your friends go to a website on your phones to use them as controllers. This year's Party Pack supports up to 10 players thanks to the inclusion of Pack 9s new game Quicksort, but all of the games in this pack support an audience feature that allows up to 10,000 players to play along and affect the game in various ways. If you want to know more about the series or an older entry, I'll have a playlist linked in the description where I've been reviewing every game in the series. But that's enough exposition. Let's jump straight into our first game, Fibbage 4. If there's any Jackbox game that really didn't need a sequel, it's Fibbage. The reason I say this is because there's never been anything wrong with any of the previous three. Even Fibbage XL from the first Jackbox holds up extremely well in both the gameplay and visual departments. Unlike some other Jackbox sequels, I can still go back to any version of Fibbage and have a great time without feeling like I'm missing out on too much. Although, it could be the team at Jackbox feel similarly, but felt it appropriate to include here since we haven't seen a Fibbage game in several years. And it is a fan favorite after all. But for anyone unfamiliar, how does this game work? In Fibbage, up to 8 players are told in a fill-in-the-blank trivia question. On your phone, you enter what you think sounds like a plausible answer to said trivia. Then everyone's fake answers are thrown up on the screen alongside the one real answer, and you have to guess which one it is. Voting on the real answer gives you points, but if you vote for your friend's fake answer, or lies as the game calls them, they get points instead of you. This plays out for a few rounds, and the player at the most points by the end is a winner. A really solid formula that has basically stayed unchanged throughout the years, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Fibbage is a pretty fun trivia game after all. I mean, it was popular enough to get four iterations. So what's new? Well, for starters, the visuals are a huge departure from what we saw in Fibbage 3. Fibbage 3 presented a retro 70s aesthetic that was super pleasant to look at. The pastel colors coupled with the bubbly animations and especially the soundtrack, all culminated to one of the best presented Jackbox games ever. How do you top that? Fibbage 4's answer was to go in the complete opposite direction, sporting an abstract collage theme? I don't know, it's so bizarre that's genuinely the best I could describe it. It looks nice though. It's very bold and I personally think it gives a style in Fib 3 a run for its money. In terms of gameplay changes, the biggest addition Fibbage 4 introduces is the inclusion of three new round categories, a new final round, and some improved audience features. Starting with the new round categories, you got Cookie's VHS Vault, a round where you were shown a clip from an old movie or show, and then are asked a question about said media, VIP, very important person, sometimes being very important dead person, a question about what else, a very important person, and then Fibbage Fan Fact, an outlandish fact submitted by a fan of Jackbox games. The highlight here are the VHS Vault questions. They're a great addition that adds some good variety to your standard game of Fibbage. The other two categories I am less enthusiastic about. Very important person questions don't really feel that different from your standard rounds, especially since there are already questions during the normal Fibbage rounds about people both dead and alive. And no, I don't mean in previous Fibbage games. I mean even in Fibbage 4, there are questions about people in pop culture that are not included in this category despite the round playing out no differently. Then the Fibbage fan fact, as charming as it is to see passionate fans send over video to Jack Jackbox games, all it amounts to is some random guy awkwardly standing in front of his camera telling you something about himself that may or may not be very interesting. If you're in tune with the social world around you, you could potentially know some of the other trivia in Fibbage, whereas the fan fact questions are truly a complete guessing game. Again, a humbling inclusion, but it just feels a bit awkward. While the VHS Vault truly is one of the best round categories we've seen, I overall prefer the exclusive categories found in Fibbage 3. Trivia about obscure inventions or dumb celebrity tweets, I feel feel are more in line with the unconventional theming of Fibbage, and they make for more interesting rounds. While the new categories may not hit the mark, the new final round certainly does, and it just might be one of the most conceptually interesting rounds we've seen in the series. The way it works is that you get two fill in the blank prompts and need to write a lie that could potentially fit both blanks. Even though you only submit one lie, both of the questions will have two completely different answers. So everyone's lies get thrown up on the screen alongside the two true answers, one for each question and you need to pick which answer you think is the true for the left and the right prompt independently from each other. Definitely a bit more complicated than what you would expect from Fibbage. And I have seen people straight up not understand what was going on during this round. But personally, I really like it. It makes you think more critically since the best final lies 
should be appropriate for both blanks. And it can be hard to think of an answer that flexible on the spot. Some people might not like the complexity of the round, but I do think the added difficulty is worth the payoff, and it makes for a fantastic way to cap off the game. Finally, the audience feature was once again improved. In previous entries, players who joined mid-game could vote on an additional lie that would be thrown up on the screen, and could vote for lies that would contribute to the in-game player scores. That's all still here, but they've now given the players and the audience their own score, although they can't win the game. Having an on-screen score serves in making the audience players feel like they're more a part of the game than they would otherwise. Plus, they get ranked at the end on how well they did, which is always fun. Despite it being more of the same without any major changes, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't fun to play Fibbage again. And it being included here probably makes Jackbox 9 the best pack to buy if you're looking to buy a Jackbox that has a Fibbage inclusion. I don't know if it beats out Fibbage 3. Like I said earlier, I do think the extra round categories there were overall better. Nevertheless, Fibbage 4 does have its advantages such as one of the best final rounds we've seen, a bold new art style, and a great soundtrack. Maybe not Fibbage 3 great, but I mean hey. Fibbage 3 has one of the best soundtracks to any party pack game, so if this fourth entry even gets close, I'd say it's doing pretty well for itself. At the end of the day, Fibbage 4 is a blast to play, and is very competently made. However, also returning this year is Fibbage Enough About You, and this one is a bit more of a letdown. So, introduced in Fibbage 3 was a sub mode called Enough About You, although I don't think it's unfair to consider it as its own standalone game given how thematically different it feels. Enough About You has the same structure as Fibbage, except the catch was all the questions were about you and your friends. It will ask a question about yourself, you answer honestly, then it will ask everyone else the same question you got and have them make up a lie for it. When your question shows up, all of your friends' lies and your truth get thrown up on the screen, you get points if players pick your truth, and they get points if people pick their lie. It's the same basic structure Fibbage has with a more personalized twist that makes this great to play with a close group of friends. This was one of my favorite things about Fibbage 3, although the thing that took it down a notch for me was the final round. It asked you to enter one truth and one lie about yourself. You got points when people selected your lie, so the idea was to enter something true about yourself that sounded fake, and something fake that sounded true. Ultimately, the problem with this is that it's just way too open-ended. Something I saw a lot, and I mean a lot a lot, is when people couldn't think of something good, they would just enter some non-coherent bullcrap or joke submissions that didn't really mean anything. And hey, not trying to throw shade, because multiple times I was also that person. Unless you're thinking about it in advance, it's kind of hard to come up with something true about yourself that sounds like a lie when you're put on the spot. When I saw that Pac-9 sequel game was Fibbage, initially I was like, why? But over time I warmed up to it because I figured if nothing else, it was the perfect opportunity to fix the final round in Enough About You, and just have this super solid game built around the social chemistry of your friend group. I mean, after all, it's the only big critique I've ever had of anything Fibbage related. So what did they do to perfect this final round? Get rid of it completely! I excuse me, what? Yeah, Enough About You straight up does not have a final round to speak of now. Once you've gone through everyone's single prompt, the game just ends. On one hand, the final round was the weakest part of Fibbage 3's Enough About You. On the other hand, not having a final round at all makes games feel inconclusive. Like watching a movie of only 2x. Especially with the genius that is Fibbage 4's final round. I find it surprising they didn't implement it into Enough About You. You could totally have the same setup where there are two fill-in-the-blank questions and you write one submission for both of them. However, here, the idea would be to enter something that makes one statement true and the other false. Hell, even let the player select which one was true or false for added flexibility. It could be possible they thought of something similar, but just thought it was too complicated. But come on, a complicated final round is better than no final round. So I guess the question now is, was enough about you better with a problematic final round or no final round? I don't know. Weird analogy, but to me it's comparable to like when two kids are fighting over a toy or something, and then the adult comes in and is like, alright, well if you two are gonna be like this, then nobody gets it. Is that better? I mean, the fighting stopped, but it really wasn't the ideal outcome for anyone involved. As an aside, I notice answers do not combine in this version of Fibbage when multiple players enter the same lie. In previous versions, the game would be like, oh, and this was also this person's lie. But here, it just presents duplicates on the voting screen. Anyways, I don't want any of this to distract from the fact that Fibbage 4 is still 
a very well made game. I'm not sure if I'd consider it the best version of the game. Nonetheless, it's still impressively produced, and it's always great to have an excuse to play more footage. Rumoring. This is our Quiplash Child game of the pack with a theme emulating reality TV shows, most notably Big Brother. Up to 9 players, which apparently was a number chosen solely because 9 players made for a better looking UI, start the game by choosing a character trait to roleplay by. You're given 3 suggestions such as things like yoga instructor, sandwich artist, stuff like that. But you can also enter your own if none of the 3 suggestions suit your fancy. The game then takes you and your friends through 5 rounds where you enter things about yourself or other players. All of which encourage you to roleplay by the trait you selected at the start of the game. Round 1 is introductions where you enter something about yourself. Round 2 is connections where you write something about another player, generally positive. Round 3 is the quickie, the round that takes just as long as any other round. The catch with this one though is that your answer is kept anonymous. Round 4, the fire starter, prompts you with writing beef about another player. And then the final round asks you to recall and relay your experience with the game of rumoring you just played. With the exception of the final round, the climax of each round is voting a player out. The player whose answer received the most votes gets a random bonus, such as getting immunity from being voted out, choosing a player that doesn't get the vote, or being the sole determiner of who gets voted out. Once everyone decides on which player to vote out, that player gets the right parting words as they're thrusted out the door, and then let back in disguise to someone else. <laughs> Oh, yeah. The groups I played with always got a kick out of this since it just reuses your name if certain vowels changed. Sometimes in very unintentionally funny ways like when it changed someone's username from shy guy to shy gay. He loves complaining. But yeah, nobody ever gets truly kicked out. All voting a player out truly amounts to is changing their character traits and making them lose some points. All of the rounds of course have their own established guidelines, but structurally every round plays out exactly the same. You submit an answer, players vote for the best one, then a player gets voted out. Except not really. Start to finish, that is the game. At the very end, you get to vote on which player you think should win the game, and which player you think should not. Players you vote should win the game receive a point, and players you vote should not lose a point. The player with the most points by the end is the winner. That's rumoring, and I gotta be honest, I'm a bit mixed on this one. Rumoring's biggest drawback is that it's painfully long, clocking in at over half an hour for most of the games I played. The only other previous Jackbox games that took this long is a 10 player game with Drawful Animate and Weapons Drawn, which isn't an excuse either because long run times was my biggest problem with those games as well. Although I think that runtime is even more apparent in rumoring than it was for those other games because start to finish, you only ever enter and vote for five text submissions that entire game. That is one text submission for each round and nothing else to break up the gameplay. I mean, it's a pretty bare bones game beyond all the bells and whistles. For the other half an hour games, Drawful Anime essentially had 10 rounds coupled with Fibbage-esque lying and Weapons Drawn had several other complications that made up the game's runtime. Whereas as at its core, Rumoring is basically another take on the Quiplash formula, and when you compare it to something like Quiplash 3, that was a game where you also only enter 5 things, but takes a fraction of the time at only around 12 to 15 minutes. That's not to say there aren't laughs to be had. Myself and those I played with have had our handful of chuckles each and every play session. Nonetheless, the bottom line for me at least, is that the payoff is not strong enough to justify the huge time commitment this game asks. Especially Especially when comparing to other Jackbox games such as Talking Points, Quiplash, or Survive the Internet, which generally do provide much more comedy. In fact, I would actually say Survive the Internet is Rumoring's closest comparison. Both games have you entering text submissions, often riffing off other players, and then voting from a wall of answers. As far as the wall of answers thing is concerned, I basically feel the same way about it here as I did in Survive the Internet. If you have a full game of 9 players, and that first answer shown is just as funny as the last answer shown, the first answer is at a huge disadvantage when it was shown off nearly a minute ago. And what people are currently laughing at is that final answer. I personally prefer the games that break the players into groups so that your judgment on what answer was the funniest is less biased. And bias is definitely a problem with rumoring. With the exception of the third round, you will always know who submitted what answer, which can definitely contribute to players deciding to vote or not vote on particular responses dependent on who submitted it. You know that was Jordan. What, if you knew about me, it wouldn't be voting? For me. Yes! There's a reason most of the fill in the blank Jackbox games keep everything anonymous until the votes are in. And I think it's very telling when a certain player is getting dogpiled during the other rounds and then does exceedingly well during the anonymous round. The dogpiling can be especially bad when it comes to voting out a player since the player voted out has to give up points to the other players. Taking points from a person voted out is like punching them while they're down. I mean, they're already in this position because they likely had the lowest scoring answer. And now they get to lose more points? I know they're trying to 
do the whole reality TV thing with the mechanic of voting out players, and in that context, it could be funny, but it doesn't amount to anything beyond making players lagging behind perform even worse. In fact, one of my biggest gripes of rumoring, despite it taking too long, is that between being a balanced party game and being a good imitation of a reality TV show, it doesn't commit to either side of the spectrum. I mean, you identify each and every player's answer throwing anonymity at the window, which contributes to more of the reality TV vibe, but then you have the elimination aspect that doesn't actually do anything besides have a player lose points, because hey, it's still also trying to be a party game. The biggest obstacle this game needed to tackle was the elimination. What I imagined likely happened is they wanted to have the elimination aspect since it's so commonplace in reality TV shows, but didn't want players to straight up be out of the game, so they just fell back on it making a player lose points. If they wanted to lean in the party game direction and still have the quote-unquote eliminated player still lose points, it should have been countered by giving that player some sort of advantage during the next voting round, such as letting that player decide on who cannot vote as long as it isn't the winning player of that round. Or conversely, this could have been made into a team game where voting a player out kicks them out of your team and then thrusts them onto the other. That way elimination feels more significant, but said player is still playing the game. I don't want to make it sound like rumoring is a bad game, because it's not. Like I said, I've had my share of laughs from the games I played. That being said, the premise of a reality TV show themed Jackbox game is such a fantastic idea that I can't help but feel disappointed when it seems the concept wasn't taken full advantage of. Rumoring can still be some fun, and ironically in line with the whole roommate theme. The best environment for this game probably would be a group of friends that all exclusively know each other in person. Either that or a group where nobody knows anyone. Because take it from the games I played, having a lobby where half the players know each other and the other half don't will likely just lead to voting biases. So so as long as you cater to the group of people you're playing with, this one could still be a good time. And hey, for all its faults, it does a great job at keeping you engaged thanks to the presentation alone. The animations and theming are a ton of fun, the host is quirky and entertaining, and that soundtrack just slaps. Jackbox 9, in general, I think has the absolute best soundtrack we've seen out of a Jackbox game, and tracks like Rumoring's main theme really exemplifies that. <laughs> Rumoring is a game with a lot of style, with a few sprinkles of genius here and there. Its shortcomings can be disappointing, and this definitely won't be replacing games like Quiplash for me, but it's far from an abject failure either. Be mindful of the group you decide to play with, and give the game a go yourself to see what you think. Junktopia. Junktopia is a game where you click on a PNG and then write two silly things about it. Alright, alright, I'll be serious. Junktopia, up to 8 players in an audience, is a game where you and your friends have been turned into frogs by this geriatric wizard. Luckily, he'll turn one of you back to human under the pretense of whoever the best entrepreneur is. Weird setup for a presentation game, but I dig it. So the game is structured like this. On your device, you are shown three random objects, all of different values. You have to choose one of them to do a presentation on. I'm not sure how they determine what item should be worth what value, but regardless, they do have different price tags on them that all eat into your score by varying amounts. Once you buy an item, you are asked if you want to haggle the price tag. Prior to the game's release, it was being talked up like it was this feature that really added a lot of strategy, but all it amounts to is that you tap a button, and then a virtual coin flip happens that decides whether or not you have to pay more or less than the initial retail. No strategy or skill whatsoever, just random chance. After that, you name your item you bought, and write two things about it. Then it's time to present. And by present, I mean the bare minimum since everything you wrote down shows up on the screen. You're encouraged to talk aloud, but you don't really have to. Everyone presents their items, and then you vote on who had the best one. One thing I do want to give Junktopia credit for is how the voting works. Firstly, with big player counts, it will separate everyone into two groups to avoid voting on eight things at once. It helps compartmentalize how well each player did when you're only being asked to review a few at a time, and I always prefer this over voting on a wall of submissions. Secondly, to streamline the voting process even further, the game gives you multiple votes, but only allows for you to vote for two objects at a time. Was item A better than item B? Was item B better than item C? It ends up creating a hierarchy of votes that generally leads to each player's receiving at least one vote. Definitely feels a lot better than getting zero votes. Once all the presentations are given and the votes are in, you're shown the scoreboard and then on to round two, which is more of the same with the only difference being that during the shopping process, you have the option to buy a mystery item, a completely random item with a super cheap price tag. It's not much, but I do appreciate the risk reward element here. After that, same deal as before. Enter some details about your item, present it, and then vote. This is about the time where everyone starts complaining that the game hasn't ended yet, because by this point you've all been 
been playing for almost half an hour. I always have to be like, no, 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 wait. The last round is really fast, I promise. Which thankfully isn't a lie because about that time, I'm basically done with the game too. Speaking of which, the estimated time on the menu is a blatant lie. I have never had a full eight player game be any shorter than 29 minutes. So I don't know where they're getting this max of 25 here. For as long as the game can run, I do appreciate the final round since it is creative and is quick. At this point, you've bought two items. So all you have to do is name them as if they are part of a set. No presentations to give or anything. Just name your bundle and then everybody else votes for the most clever title. Final scores are tallied up and the player of the most money is turned back into a beautiful ebony man. You're black? Oh, it was black the whole time, guys. It did it. Oh boy, where do I begin? I'll just start by getting one of my most pedantic critiques out of the way. And it's going to sound weird, but hear me out. The graphics, the sound, the overall presentation in Junktopia is way too pleasant to make for a comedic atmosphere. You think of other Jackbox presentation games that did well. Patently Stupid and Talking Points. The environments are very bright, and the soundtrack is very upbeat. It lends itself well to the more outgoing vibe a presentation game excels in. I mean, presentation without energy is just like work or school. The music in Junktopia is this easy listening, pleasant sounding music. It has a bit of a mysterious vibe thanks to the common use of that theremin, but ultimately it's still something that is too relaxed. It's well made, don't get me wrong. But music like this works best in laid back games such as Pole Mine. When the aim of your game is big laughs, I'm sorry, this just doesn't work. The sound design coupled with the rustic looking antiques here doesn't make me want to tell jokes. It makes me want to sit next to a cozy fire. I don't think there are any rules to how a Jackbox game should go about its theming, but undoubtedly, comedy works much better in a more lively environment. Not to mention, the game feels restrictive in much the same way that Joke Boat from Pack 6 was. Again, all you're doing here is picking one of three objects given to you, and then filling out two note card sized blurbs about them. I mean, sure, you can write whatever you want, but how much is there really to say about a random cutout of an object? Again, comparing to some of the past successful presentation games, Patently Stupid and Talking Points, you can really riff on the scenarios you're put in and elaborate in creative ways. Patently stupid because you are literally creating a solution to a problem with your own invention, and talking points because you're trying to weave a single narrative through multiple pictures on the fly. The reason patently stupid in particular works so well is because it really felt like you were trying to make that sale. You made the item and you gotta land that pitch. There's a certain confidence that comes with presenting something that you made. Confidence, I'd argue being a huge component in something being perceived as funny, which works in its favor, but in Junktopia. You just say the two silly things about your object, and that's basically it. There's nothing really to expound on beyond that. The setup makes it feel like you're taking more of a tour guide role than anything else. Just letting people know some interesting facts about a particular art piece. From my past play sessions of this one, it isn't so much people laughing as it is people showing mild interest and making passive remarks like, aw, well isn't that silly? Like a bunch of grandparents at an elementary talent show. Chunktopia is the equivalent of some guy handing you something they grabbed at a Goodwill and then being like, tell me about this. This. Like what? What do you want me to say? For some of these, what do you even say? It's not like a comedic genius couldn't find a way to make something like, I don't know, a green jacket funny. They could, but a comedic genius could also make a restrictive prompt in Joke Boat work. Which is why I think it's more than fair to compare Junktopia to Joke Boat. In my opinion, when it comes to games where the objective is to be funny, the merit in which it should be judged is how seamless it can make that comedy. Games like Quiplash or Patently Stupid are so so great because it so effortlessly sets you up for that joke. It could be argued that Junktopia also does this well since it does give you the option to use pre-written setups, but considering how nearly everyone I play with almost always chooses to write their own, I don't think it does that element particularly well either. I know fans of this game aren't going to be happy with how much I keep alluding to this, but Junktopia has a lot of parallels to Joke Boat in fact. Both games restrict your comedy in specific ways. For Joke Boat, it's a pre-written setups, and for Junktopia, it's a limited selection of pictures each player has. Both games have a strict limitation on just how much you can input yourself. Obviously, both games have this format of presenting and then having players vote on who did the best. And both games are only doing the bare minimum of being a presentation game since everything you would possibly have to say is shown on the screen anyway, almost negating the point of presenting yourself. This is the presentation game for people who like playing Jackbox Muted. Since, as mentioned, you just write two things and those two things get thrown up on the screen, people with mics don't have that much more of an advantage. That might sound like a plus to some people, but to me, saying people who cannot talk or at more 
or less an even playing field during a presentation game is a huge red flag. Because if you're being so restricted in a game all about putting yourself out there and making that sale, that even the ability to verbally showcase your item isn't that big of an advantage, then I would argue it's struggling at its job of being a funny presentation game. And that's basically the bottom line. Either go all out and make a presentation game that benefits from people talking out loud, or make another word entry game like Quiplash. This halfway approach they took doesn't do the game any favors, because Junktopia isn't as good of a presentation game as Talking Points are Apparently Stupid, and it isn't as snappy of a fill in the blank game as Quiplash or Job Job. It's a shame too, because there are things in Junktopia I really like. The host is super funny, he has a great voice, and that animation of him waving cracks me up every time I see it. The music does a great job of setting a laid back yet mysterious atmosphere, very fitting of an antique shop. Again, I don't think it aids the comedy particularly well, but it's well made regardless. And finally, I think this game has the most fair voting system in place out of all the presentation games. I should briefly mention that the audience feature is well done too. Audience members can vote for their favorite items alongside the players, providing some extra cash. And during the shopping process, they can vote on which player should receive a discount. It's just enough to help additional players feel like they're involved in the game. And it's well done. Despite all my whining, Junktopia isn't a bad game or anything, and with the right group of people, it can provide a mildly entertaining experience. But I don't see any reason to play this over the previously mentioned presentation games. Damn, I didn't mean for this review to be so critical. Let's lighten things up with Nonsensory. One of the more interesting concepts seen in this year's Jackbox is Nonsensory, which is a game that is half guessing, half drawing, half reading the room, half... Look, this is a weird one to categorize. Let me just tell you how it works. The game is split up into three rounds, all of which having the player approach them in different ways. Round one is the writing test. The game will ask you something like, write the first line of a dating profile for someone who is 50% likely to be a hungry bear. So in this situation where you got 50% like that, you would want to write something that could go either way. For this example, you'd want to write something that would be said by a normal person or a bear. Once everyone submits their text responses, the game will show everyone else your prompt, but not what percentage it gave you. It's up to them to figure that out by guessing. You and your friends receive more points the closer their guesses are to whatever your assigned percentage was. So it's in everyone's best interest to not be cryptic. And while guessing, if you are absolutely certain it's going to be a specific percentage, there's a button you can hold to add confidence to your vote. This will provide double points if you're within range of the correct answer, but take points on the off chance that you're not. Round two is the same idea, except you're drawing now. Draw a toy that is three out of 10 lovable, for example. So not very the final round also has players drawing, but this one's a lot more complicated since you're now being asked to draw something between two points, such as draw something that is halfway between dancing and fighting, like the previous rounds. The exact percentage it is asking for is completely random every time you play. Like if I got this same prompt except the arrow was all the way on the fighting side, then I wouldn't want to include dancing at all. Once again, all the players will get to see your submission and vote exactly on the scale where they think the percentage lies, between receiving points for your answers and from accurately voting on others. The player of the highest score at the end is a winner. At its core, Nonsensory is a really fun party game with fair design, and as a bonus, can be unexpectedly funny simply due to how ridiculous some of the prompts can be, especially when you get to the drawing prompts. I mean, bad art is already funny in most Jackbox games, but couple that with a weird ass prompt like, where does this drawing belong between breakfast and owl? It can yield some pretty humorous responses. Not to mention, the included options on this game make Nonsensory one of the most flexible Jackbox games ever. Don't like the drawing prompts? and just want the tech stuff? You can do that. Or conversely, think the drawing prompts are more fun and don't care about the writing rounds? You can make every round a drawing round. Initially, I was going to comment on how Jackbox 9 doesn't have a dedicated drawing game, but through the settings, you can make this a dedicated drawing game. Super cool. This ended up being one of my favorite Jackbox games. Although, I do have a few nitpicks. Minor ones, but I'll just get them out of the way. The first one has to do with how the drawings you make render onto the screen. It has a varying and seemingly random line weight to everything. Line weight, for those who are not familiar with drawing software, Software, is the line thickness between pen strokes. This isn't inherently a bad thing. A lot of drawing software will make your lines thicker the harder you press down on the screen, and a feature like that is generally a good one. The issue is that when you're actually drawing, all of the line weight is uniform. So in most situations, how your drawing looks on your phone is not how it's going to look on the TV. This typically doesn't matter too much, but because of the way the line weight works in this game, if you do a little peck for a single dot, it's going to be practically invisible by the time it makes 
makes its way to the TV. Then there's the overall pacing, which I think could be a little faster. Not Sensory is surprisingly one of the shorter games this year, generally lasting shy of 25 minutes. I say surprisingly because even that runtime seems a little long. And at least for non sensory specifically, you could easily trim that runtime down by speeding up the transitions. I think the biggest culprit of wasted time is how long it takes to divvy out points to the players. So it shows all the plugs going into the wall, it will like pause and show the lone plug if there's one way off guess, then it pauses to have the host be like, oh my, a lone guess right there, ain't it? Then it highlights a bunch of numbers before showing the true percentage, it sits there, then pulls out all the nearby plugs, waits, pulls out the further away plugs, and then solves again so the host can be like, oh man, you weren't quite on the mark of that one, maybe next time. At the cost of sounding insanely impatient, shut the f*** up! Just go! Just pull all the plugs out at once and go! The stalling might not even be so obvious if it wasn't for the fact that the game is dead silent during all of this. Only playing sound effects. I mean, listen to this. What did we all feel was correct? You're out by yourself, it seems. Well, someone got close. These answers are less impressive. That's not just me, right? Feels like the whole thing could have been sped up. The last thing to mention is something they actually removed since the demo. In the demo, you could hold the percentage you were voting for to simultaneously add confidence and vote. But now, since they removed that, you always have to do the two separately. On one hand, it's easier to understand when it's set up this way. On the other, the game now has to wait several seconds after everyone's done voting to give them some time to add confidence just in case they decide to do that. The game will wait like five or so seconds and will do that up to 24 times on an eight player game. Eight times for each of the three rounds, that is. That time it takes stalling can easily add up to nearly two minutes of waiting before the answer is shown every game, even though the game could have been substantially sped up in certain areas. The things I mentioned are still just nitpicks at the end of the day, because non-sensory is not only a unique inclusion, but a fun one as well. Non-sensory is conceptually engaging, and is a game I'll definitely be revisiting Pack 9 just to play. Last, but certainly not least, is Quicksort, which is definitely the sleeper hit of this party pack. When it was first announced, the trailer was pretty vague, so a lot of us didn't know what to think of it. But once fans got to finally try it, the overall reception to this game has been fairly positive. I saw a lot of people enjoying it way more than they thought they would. This is probably the hardest game to explain, but fortunately for me, all you need to do is look at the screen to get an immediate idea of what's happening. Although, for those just listening to this in the background, I will try to verbally explain it anyways. The TLDR is that Quicksort is Trivia Tetris, or like, timeline trivia. Of the 10 players are split into two teams, and the first team up votes between two trivia categories. The second category always being a mystery, so you probably don't want to pick it unless your first category is absolutely terrible or you're feeling ballsy. So if you get the prompt, eh, just using one I got here. Kids WB shows. In the hierarchy was oldest show to newest shows. You would place the older shows on the left and the newer shows towards the right. Like Animaniacs. That's one of the first kids WB shows. So that would be placed all the way on the left. One by one, each player in the team takes turns dropping their answer blocks until everything has been sorted. At which point the game will show you how well you did. Obviously the rubric on how well you performed being based on how close your place blocks were to the correct order. Once team 1 finishes, team 2 is up doing the same exact thing with a different prompt. This goes on for 3 rounds, rounds 2 and 3 adding a few additional rules. Round 2 introduces fake blocks that don't belong in the conveyor at all and need to be trash, oftentimes sounding close to a correct prompt, but being misspelled or being a parody of the current topic. Then round 3 is the same as 2, except they let you redo the entire thing to fix any mistakes you might have made, which eats up so much time. But more on that later. Scoring is based not only on how accurate your placement was, but also on how many correct streaks you got. Team with the most points by the end wins. I love Jackbox games like this because they make great use of the medium being a digital game you have to control with your phone. Adding pressure by having blocks slowly fall down is something that really wouldn't work in a tabletop format. And allowing up to 10 players is a limitation that isn't supported on most consoles. So kudos to the team for coming up with something this clever and something so perfectly suited for Jackbox. Another perk of the game is the fact that it's cooperative. In most trivia games, Games, you get a question, and you either know it or you don't. But here, you might know a little bit, or someone else on your team might know all of it. The game encourages you to combine all of your knowledge and sort of direct each other on what to do, which makes for a chaotic, albeit very fun play session. It's a great game, although much like many of the other games this year, its biggest downside is the time commitment. It doesn't seem too bad when you're playing, but since this game is team-based, both teams are switching off taking turns. And when the other team is up, there's literally zero reason to 
watch or be engaged whatsoever since both teams received completely different prompts. In last year's poll mine, even when your team wasn't currently up, it was still important to listen in on the opposing team to get an idea of what they voted for and their current thought process. Whereas in Quicksort, since you're given a completely separate category, there's nothing to be gained by watching your opponents play. You could quite literally just step out of the room for about three whole minutes and miss nothing. There's also a lot of little things that eat up a lot of time. The biggest culprit in my eyes are the fake blocks. Why are they here? Either you know the prompt and you're going to take extra time to trash it, or you don't know the prompt and are taking extra time to place something on the conveyor that will only penalize you further. If you had to be conservative about the space on the conveyor, it would be justified. But on the versus mode, you have plenty of space, so it doesn't really matter. Aw oh man, if only there was an extra mode we'll be talking about later where it did matter. Another huge time sink is the final round letting you, quite literally, redo everything. Once again, why? If a team gets a prompt they're not familiar with, you now have to wait twice as long as you normally would have, since they're just going to end up repositioning all the blocks for a second time. If one team was really lagging behind and it gave them this little bonus to catch up, that would be one thing. But in the final round, both teams get to completely redo their order regardless of the current score. For reference, this game is about 25 to 30 minutes, and almost half of that time is spent on the final round. Also, where are they getting these time estimations? This game is not 15 to 20 minutes. The absolute shortest play session I have on my hard drive of this game is 25 minutes. And in that session, both teams basically nailed the final round prompt, so there wasn't much to reorganize. If you're a patient little saint and don't care mindlessly waiting while the other team plays what is practically their own independent game session, you might not be too bothered by the runtime, but I can't help but think there's a more engaging way they could have done the team mode. If I had to make a suggestion, I'd propose giving one prompt to both teams, and then switching off between answer blocks. The round could start off by placing the beginning and the end blocks for reference, and then from there, you would get points for placing a block in its intended location, but even more for accurately placing it between what's currently on the conveyor. I'm not saying replace what's currently in the game, but it could have been a nice mode to include for more impatient players. And trust me, I've played with multiple people at this point who have commented on the fact that they have to wait to play. However, also included is Quicksort Forever, and despite it being more Quicksort at its core, it fixes just about every issue I have with the normal mode, and justifies many design choices. In fact, it's such a stark difference, I'm actually going to consider it as its own game. Quicksort Forever is Quicksort, except, as the name would suggest, you keep going forever until you make too many mistakes. Much like actual Tetris. There is no teams in this one. It's just everyone working together to try to get the highest score possible. Due to this, there's no downtime. You're all in until it's over. Elements like the garbage blocks are given more of a purpose here. As mentioned in standard quicksort, they sort of just take up time since you either trash them or you erroneously put them on the conveyor not realizing they were fake. In forever mode though, every mistake you make is actively taking up space on the board, which beyond justifying the trash blocks, adds importance to the exact placement of your blocks. Something that is more or less a non-issue in the standard quicksort. Even though Forever, I'd argue, is a less flawed variant of the game, I am glad both are here because it's nice to have another team-based game. One thing I feel I should mention that applies to both variants of the game, sometimes the way prompts are worded can make it confusing as to exactly what it's asking you to rank, and other times some blocks marked as garbage are blatantly wrong. So we got a prompt that asks us to rank all the movies by their popularity of their soundtrack, we get Chicken Run and then put it all the way to the left because it was a much smaller name in comparison to all the other prompts we were getting, but then the game in insisted it was a trash prompt and so we got no points for it. Okay, Chicken Run definitely does have an original soundtrack and said soundtrack did have a physical release. So either this was a mistake on their end or this goes back to the prompts not being too clear on what it's asking for. Thankfully that is more of an exception than a rule because it's otherwise a fantastic game. The sound design is lively, the visuals are slick, Quicksort is an ingenious take on your standard trivia game and can make for some energetic play sessions as you're all yelling over each other as to where a block should go. Definitely a solid way to cap off this year's party back. And that's Jackbox 9. Despite how critical I've been throughout the review, Jackbox 9 truly is one of the best in the series. There are definitely games I like more than others, but there's nothing this year I would consider straight up bad. Nonsensory and Quicksort are two of the most original ideas we've seen from the studio. Junktopia and Rumoring offer familiar gameplay experiences that will likely appeal to fans of presentation and fill in the blank games respectively. And while Fibbage isn't exactly the game I think needed a sequel, it makes Pac-9 a great value if you're looking for a Jackbox with a Fibbage inclusion. From what I've heard and seen from others, it seems that, with the exception of Fibbage, every game in this pack has been considered as one of their favorites by someone, which is a pretty impressive feat on its own. I'm giving the Jackbox Party Pack 9 a 4.4 out of 5. There doesn't seem to be any clear winners this
this year like Job Job was last year, where basically everyone was on the same page calling it one of the best. And if anything, Pack 9s biggest problem is how long all of these games run. With the exception of Fibbage, it feels like some culling could have been done in all of them. Regardless, Pack 9 offers a lot of variety and overall I think is a step up from last year's pack. So get ready to meet some new roommates, lie about and organize trivia, sell junk, and guess where something lies between Sofa and Dragon? Because the Jackbox Party Pack 9 has games that will appeal to just about everyone. Hey, thanks for watching. I wanted to cover 9 while it was still semi-relevant. I promise I didn't forget about packs 7 and 8. Either way, I'd like to thank patrons such as Abby Knudsen, Amanda Goof, Awesome Games, Cameron Tayo, David Marquezzi, David Pacheco, Drew Kellenberger, GamePlayer1500, Jeffrey Long, Kinzel TN, Victoria Mars, and Rami Better. Again, thanks for watching, and until next time, have a good one.